Hare Krishna, everyone, and a very warm welcome back to our continued series on the glories of Sri Vrindavandam. Let us begin with the proper etiquette. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Goravani Pracharine Nivishesha Shunyavadi Pashtacha Desha Tarine O glories to Prabhupada. So, today, tomorrow, and the next day, according to where you live in the world, begins the all-auspicious month of Kartik, or the month of Damodar, Damodar Mas. So I, I thought that um, today it would be appropriate to, to begin this month by um, giving a talk on the importance of Kartik as well as the uh, central pastime of this month, which is Krishna's being bound to a grinding mortar by his um, loving mother, Yashoda. So with your permission. <laughs> so first of all, <clears throat> the month of Kartik is especially favorable for spiritual practices. Just as the hour before sunrise, is the most suspicious time of the day for spiritual practices. So in the yearly cycle of 12 months, it said the month of Kartik is the most favorable month for spiritual practices. I found a beautiful quote, actually, in my research, and I'll share it with you. Just as Vrindavan is the topmost of all holy places, Srimad Bhagavatam, the topmost amongst all scriptures, Krishna, the topmost of all personalities, Srimati Tulsi Devi, the topmost amongst plants, Satya Yuga, the topmost amongst the four yugas, Mother Ganges, the topmost amongst all flowing rivers. So the month of Kartik is the topmost of all the months of the year. And it has arrived. <laughs> the Shastras also say that just as the result of giving 10,000 cows in charity can be attained simply by offering one Tulsi leaf to the lotus feet of Sri Krishna, so the result of taking bath in all the holy places in creation can be achieved by taking a bath in one morning during the auspicious month of Kartik. And the Padma Purana also has something to say about the auspicious month of Kartik. <clears throat> it says, the Lord may offer liberation or even material happiness to a devotee, but once one has rendered devotional service in Vrindavan, particularly in the month of Kartik, such a devotee ends up hankering only for pure devotional service. Pure devotional service. Now, obviously by observing Kartik, devotees can purify themselves of sinful reactions. It's described one matures very quickly in, in devotion. And actually one qualifies oneself for returning back to Godhead. <clears throat> now such achievements are confirmed by a, a beautiful story that I found in the Padma Purana, the Bhumikanda Canto 4, Chapter 24. It's about um, a Sudrani named Kali Priya, who actually lived in Treta Yuga. Now, this lady, Kali Priya, she was dissatisfied with her husband and was always hankering for a lover, a, a paramour. And she very much despised her pious husband. It's described she would uh, speak harshly to him, feed him all kinds of unclean foods. She neglected her household duties and she tortured him by acting uh, inappropriately in the presence of other men. So her desires were finally fulfilled when she met a man a lover, a paramour, with whom she planned to elope. 
So on that fateful night, they were going to elope. Uh, while her lover waited for her in in the jungle, Kalipriya slit her husband's throat. But meanwhile, while her lover, but meanwhile, her lover was attacked by and killed by a tiger in the jungle. <laughs> Both guys died. So when she eventually found her her dead lover, Kalipriya was so shocked. It says she came to her senses. And she actually lamented that she'd killed her husband. So wanting to atone for her sins, she went to um, a holy place, a, a sacred town or, or city, it said, where she found Vaishnavis worshipping Radha and Krishna with fruits, flowers, incense, while singing songs, <clears throat> reciting prayers, and blowing conches. So Kali Priya was intrigued. She asked these Vaishnavis, she said, please tell me what are you doing? And they answered, quote, this is the beginning of Kartik, and we are worshiping Radha and Krishna to remove all sin and elevate us to their abode. This is our vrata, this is our vow in the auspicious month of Kartik. So just hearing this, it's described, just hearing this gave uh, Kali Priya hope. So she accepted the same vows as well. And she practiced those vows very strictly during the month of Kartik. And at the end of the month, on, on the full moon day, she was freed from all sinful reaction. What's more, she gave up her body on the, the bank of the Narmada River, very auspicious river. Now at that moment, the messengers of Yamaraj arrived, the Yamadudas. But just as they were about to, to drag her soul away, Lord Vishnu's messengers also appeared, the Vishnu Dudas, and they actually intervened on Kali Priya's behalf. And they described they dismissed the Yamadudas, be gone with you. Then the, the Vishnu Dudas placed Kali Priya on their chariot and took her to the Lord's abode <coughs> to serve the divine couple directly. So Padma Purana says, such is the power of observing the worship of Radha and Dhamodar during Karti. But Padma Purana also states, conversely, that the sin of neglecting to observe one's vows, the vows you take, <laughs> the beginning of Kartik, <coughs> nullifies one's brahminical status, the benefit of 10 years of pious life, and the good results of one's hard work. It says, in short, one falls down from spiritual life. We have a saying in English, don't make promises you can't keep. So we should take vratas, we should take vows, we should take some extra time and energy and effort to advance during this very auspicious Kartik, whether we're in Vrindavan or Mayapur or London or Moscow or New York, it doesn't make any difference. The mercy is falling from the sky. <laughs> but take vows or vratas that you comfortably feel that you can accomplish. <clears throat> now, as we mentioned, another name for the month of Kartik is the month of Dhamodar. The month, this month is, is called Dhamodar for two reasons. One is that every month in our Vedic calendar has <coughs> a worshipable deity. Like the first month, uh, of the year, the worshipable deity is Keshava. So then that month becomes the month of Keshava. And the, in the next month, the worshipable deity is Narayana. So that becomes the month of Narayana, just like that. So the last month of the year, which we're in now, the worshipable deity's name is Dhamodar. Now the second reason that this month is called Dhamodar 
is because, again, of that very famous and touching pastime of Mother Yasoda tying Krishna to a grinding mortar with a rope, which took place in this month. And as a result, the month became known as Damodar. In Sanskrit, rope is called Dhamma, and the belly is called Udara. So a person on whose belly, Udara, is tied a rope, Dhamma, is called Dhamodara, Dhamma Udara. And that's our Krishna. Now the pastime of Krishna being bound to the grinding motor took place actually when Krishna was a small child. And while, <coughs> while living in Gokula, our acharyas have described uh, three phases of Krishna's pastimes in our beloved Vrindavan. His Kumara pastimes when he was a baby, his Pogonda pastimes when he was a young boy, and his Kaishora pastimes when he's a little older, when he's a teenager. Actually, he doesn't grow beyond that. He's always 16 or 17 eternally. Nayovanamcha. He's eternally uh, youthful. So we know Krishna was born, or he appeared rather, in, in Mathura. But that very night, his father Vasudev brought him over to Vrindavan, to Gokula, where Krishna had those Kumara pastimes, the baby pastimes. Um, he stayed in Gokula for three years and four months. And while in Gokula as a baby, Krishna demonstrated his uh, full-fledged godhood. He didn't grow up to be God. Prabhupada said, God is always God. <laughs> and he displayed that godhood by, well, among other things, killing numerous demons like Putana, Tunivarta, Agasur, the cart demon, etc. However, one day, Krishna broke open the storehouse, the treasure chest of transcendental love by performing his, well, one of his most famous pastimes of being tied with the rope of Mother Yashoda's affection. It really is the crest jewel pastime of Vatsalya Ras. What is Vatsalya Ras? Vatsalya Ras is the, the rasa of parenthood, <coughs> where Krishna becomes the child of his devotee, or the mood is there. Because it's so central to this month, <coughs> we can take some time and discuss it. So one day, actually on the day of Diwali, in the month of Kartik, the month of Damodar, Mother Yasoda engaged all of her maidservants in various activities, you know, cleaning and the dishes and the garden and various household chores, etc. But it's described that although she had thousands and thousands of assistants, that particular day she did not hand over the the chore, the duty, of churning butter to any of her maidservants. They generally did that. Rather, she picked up the churning rod herself early morning and started churning curd into butter. First there's the milk, then there's the curd, then there's the butter. Now this was unusual <coughs> because well, Mother Yashoda was a queen. One of her names is Nanda Gahini. Nanda Gahini means that she was the, the principal lady in the house of Nanda Maharaj. She's the wife of Nanda Maharaj. Her husband is Nanda because he is the embodiment of bliss, Ananda. That's how we describe his name. He's the embodiment of bliss, Ananda. And she's called Yashoda or one who gives da, uh, one who gives da, one who gives da fame, yash, yashoda. And who does she give fame to? To Krishna. Actually, Krishna is famous both throughout the material and the spiritual worlds. And his fame is made po possible by Mother Yashoda, one who gives fame. 
Now, Srila Sanatana Goswami says that the main reason she decided to churn the butter herself that morning, it's really interesting, was that she was worried that Krishna, although the son of a very rich man, like Nanda Maharaj, who possessed 900,000 cows, in Vedic culture, wealth was determined by how much land you had and how many cows you had. So this son of a rich person, Nanda Maharaj, who possessed 900,000 cows, this little Krishna, he was always sneaking into other people's homes to steal milk products, like butter, curd, milk, buttermilk, etc. And every day there were complaints against Krishna. One gopi would say, today he stole butter at our house. Another gopi would say, he knocked over the pot of curd at my place. Well, another gopi would say, he spilt the milk and pinched my boys and ran away. And I was reading in Krishna book, Prabhupada said, and whenever he would be caught by these gopis, he would say, Maya, I love butter very much. I don't like the dry fruits and cooked foodstuffs as much as I love butter. He's the butter thief. So although Mother Yasoda's helpers usually churned the butter, she wanted to do the churning herself that day, hoping that the tasty butter sh churned by her would satisfy Krishna and he would become a real gentleman and not go around stealing butter in others' ho houses. That's the word I read, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Hoping that the tasty butter churned by her would satisfy Krishna and he would become a real gentleman and not go around stealing butter in others' homes. So thinking in this way, she went to the Goshwala to milk the cows. <clears throat> now she had one favorite cow that she would generally milk <clears throat> or have milked. And that cow's name was Padmaganda. This cow was special because she would always have her assistants feed that cow with the milk of other cows. Not just any other cows, but there were eight cows that were specifically denoted, denoted only for Krishna. And these cows would eat only very fragrant grasses found in uh, special meadows of Braj in particular near Govardhan Hill because the grass at Govardhan Hill, that's not sharp and it doesn't cut the, um, the cow's tongues. They like that grass over there, it's described. And it's very, very sweet. So um, the scent of these cows that emanated from their bodies, it's described, resembled the fragrance of night blooming lotuses because of the special grass they ate. So, in general, these cows were known as Padma Ganda cows. Padma means lotus and Ganda means fragrant. So strictly speaking, literally speaking, these were fragrant lotus cows. It's a beautiful term, fragrant lotus cows. Some of the Asoda would have these cows milked. On that particular day, she milked that one cow who was called Padma Ganda. And she would collect this lotus fragrant milk to boil it. And after boiling the milk, she would have the assistants make curd out of it, and that curd would be made into butter. So herself, after milking that cow, Patmaganda, and um, after making the curd on the day of Diwali, she was churning it herself to make butter for Krishna. So he didn't go steal elsewhere. So Shukadev Goswami, he says that while churning this curd, she sang the glories of the childhood pastimes of Krishna. He says, Dadhi Nirman Tane Kale. She sang while she churned the curd. And other acharyas, they comment that singing is very popular in Goloka Vrindavan. Sometimes in our public lectures, we'll say to get people enchanted by Vrindavan. We say that in the spiritual world, every step is a dance, every word is a song, and there's a festival every day. So the Acharya say singing is very popular in Goloka Vrindavan. 
They say that if a person wants to speak something there, he or she rather sings a song. That's called kataganam. Kataganam. Kataganam means a, a conversation by singing. My dear child, please bring the butter so we can have it for dinner tonight. <laughs> My dear son, please go to <laughs> Kataganam means a conversation by singing. And um, any conversation in Braja is actually a, a beautiful song. So Mother, so Mother Yasoda was a composer, a composer of such songs. And she used to sing these songs herself. Prabhupada said, we can also do this. We should do this. But if one doesn't know any particular song, then it's, uh, it's fine to simply sing the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, which is the essence of all transcendental sound vibrations, because it's non-different than Krishna. And it's the perfect way to glorify the Lord, particularly in the age of Kali Yuga. So people used to take events and then write songs about them. And that way they remember them. Actually, I found a quote from Sridhar Bhavavai. He, he said one time, if you want to remember a very important topic, then you can make it into a song. That way you can always remember it. So, what's the most important topic? Krishna consciousness. <laughs> So there's so many songs. Bhakti Vinodatukur, Naratam Dastakur. We have so many songs. So while she was doing all this, it was very early morning, and her little baby Krishna was sleeping. But as soon as he woke up, hearing the beautiful voice of his mother, Yashoda, he got out of bed. And that morning, it's described, she was singing a particularly beautiful song that she had composed. And actually, this song is very popular, we know, amongst the, the Brajabhasis, very popular. And the Sanskrit to this song goes, Gokula Pati Kula Tilaka Twam Asiha Krita Sukrita Bhraj Rochita Shuka Bhraj Nayana Nandi Samiha Quote from the mouth of Mother Yashoda, from the heart. O Krishna, O Tilak decoration in the family of Gokula's king, you bring such great happiness to the pious people of Braja by delighting their eyes with the soothing vision of your divine form. Let's recite that one more time. <clears throat> o Krishna, O Tilak decoration in the family of Gokula's king, you bring such great happiness to the people of Braj by delighting their eyes with a soothing vision of your divine form. So Krishna got up and he's attracted to this bhajan. <laughs> he, um, he, the Shastra describes, he, he naturally wanted to drink the breast milk of his mother. So it's described with sleepy eyes, he started walking in a wobbly way, like, little children do when they're first learning to, to walk towards Mother Yasoda. But as soon as Mother Yasoda saw Krishna, she told him, just wait a little while until the butter's fully churned. And simultaneously, she had a pot of milk cooking on a nearby stove. <coughs> but Krishna insisted on drinking her breast milk. So he, he jumped up onto her lap and started drinking. Shukadev Goswami uses the words stanya kama, stanya kama. He translates that as, quote, Krishna is not satisfied in Vrindavan until he drinks the breast milk of his mother. <laughs> so Mother Yashoda, she, she stopped churning. Krishna jumped up and she had to sit down. And actually she was relishing the beautiful face of Krishna who was smiling. But suddenly, Mother Yasoda saw that the milk on the stove was boiling over. So to save the milk, she quickly placed the Lord on the ground. Now, the great Vaishnava Acharya, again, Harisuri, 
he gives a very interesting comment. He says that while Mother Yasoda was feeding Krishna, this Padma Ganda milk on the stove was boiling over for a reason. Like, what? The milk was boiling over for a reason? How do you explain that? Well, he says that in the spiritual world, all things, everything and everyone, are fully conscious, fully Krishna conscious. The people, the items, the grass, the trees, the dust. <laughs> so the milk started thinking, quote, if Krishna drinks the breast milk of Mother Yasoda and he gets full, he won't be hungry afterwards and my existence will become meaningless. <laughs> I'm undertaking so many austerities by boiling myself in the heat and fire so that Krishna may enjoy me. But if he's full, all of that will soon be in vain. So he, the milk, decided to give up his life <laughs> by jumping into the fire. But don't worry, everything is eternal in, Christ in the spiritual world. <laughs> and everything's an impetus to divine love. So he wanted someone to, to witness this, so he, he spilt over into the fire in front of Mother Yashoda. <clears throat> really interesting. Now the fact that Mother Yashoda had put uh, Krishna down, it made Krishna very angry. Of course, she did that ultimately concerned about him because the milk would later be turned into his butter. But at the moment, Krishna didn't see it like that. So he started biting his lips with his teeth in anger. He was very, very much upset with Mother Yasoda. One charya writes that he was thinking, actually, I left uh, Shira Shagar, the ocean of milk, for my mother's breast milk and now she has abandoned me. <laughs> I left Shira Shagar, the ocean of milk, from my mother's breast milk, but now she's abandoned me. So Krishna took a small stone and he, he hit a, a nearby clay pot. Some acharyas say he broke the pot to pieces, while others say that he made a small hole, well, whatever. As a result, he started crying. Something like, I would say crocodile tears. Not real tears, but pretend tears, because these tears were meant to get the attention of his mother. The Acharyas say, in essence, he was saying, I am so helpless, no one wants to feed me, no one wants me. These, this is churning the sentiments of Vatsalyaras. So the Acharyas say, quote, in this way, showing a false feeling of being crestfallen by imitating fake tears. This is called duplicit illusion. Some deep philosophy to a very simple pastime. This is called duplicit illusion. But now that he had broken a pot, he started thinking, oh, I'm going to be punished. So he moved to another room or some acharyas say just a little bit outside into the courtyard where there were other pots full of butter. And he sat there and took that butter and started feeding all the monkeys, all the monkeys came. Now the acharyas say these monkeys in a previous life, they were part of Lord Ram's army. There was monkeys and bears along with Lord Ram, uh, part of the army that went to Lanka and defeated Ravana and his hordes of rakshasas. The monkeys participated. So feeling grateful to those monkeys, and these monkeys who were coming now to, to get the butter, they were the same monkeys. In this way, Krishna was paying off his debt to those monkeys. So in the meantime, Mother Yasoda came back to find Krishna where she had left him, but all she found was a broken pot. And she noticed some little footprints on the way out the door into the courtyard. So she started laughing and pick up, picking up a little bamboo stick, not for using, but for showing. Um, she followed the footprints outside. And at that time, Krishna was sitting there feeding the monkeys. 
But he was constantly looking around here and there for fear of being caught. Then suddenly he saw Mother Yasoda with stick in hand coming his way. So he just jumped up and started to run. Now Mother Yasoda tried to chase him, but she was a, a bit heavy. Her build was a bit heavy and she couldn't run so fast. And also she was tired from <laughs> turning the butter that morning. But in due course of time, she caught up with him. Actually, there's a very beautiful description of her running in the Srimad Bhagavatam. The perspiration on her face, which comes from her bhakti, service to Krishna, the flowers falling from her hair, and the swaying of her body, and so forth. There's a very beautiful description of Mother Yasoda. Finally, she caught up with Krishna. Or rather, let us say, Krishna allowed her to catch up with him because of the love she had for him. What great yogis and mystics cannot do in millions and millions of years to catch the Lord, even to get a glance from Krishna, Mother Yasoda did. It's simply another shining example of the unconquerable Lord being conquered by the power of the love of his devotees. He's the supreme controller, but he allows himself to be controlled by the love of his devotees. So as she grabbed Krishna, she grabbed him, she was a little angry. She said, Oh mischievous boy, oh Vanara Bhandu, Vanara Bhandu, friend of pestering monkeys, <laughs> you have broken the pot. And so now I'm obliged to bind you in such a way that you won't be mischievous anymore and you won't be able to go out and play with your friends. So, as soon as she lifted a small piece of rope she was carrying to bind him to a, a nearby grinding mortar, mortar. Actually, it's described in some commentaries that she took this, a silk ribbon from her hair, long enough to, to bind her boy. Krishna started to cry, rubbing his eyes with his hands, Actually, um, his right hand was caught by Mother Yashoda, I remember now. So he was actually rubbing his eyes with his left hand. Interesting details, but all the absolute truth. So now the rope she had, although sufficiently, sufficient enough to tie him up, mysteriously when she tried to tie him, it became, it, it was two inches short. To the to the to the um, grinding mortar. Oh, she called for assistance to gather some more rope nearby. But every time she attached that rope and tried to try tried to tie Krishna, it was still two inches inches short. So finally, she requested her servants to go into the palace and get all the rope <laughs> in Nandagram, which they did. But that was also two inches short. But finally, at one point, she was successful in making up for those two inches. So now we hear that these two missing inches of rope represent two things. Her efforts and the Lord's mercy. So it's described she was successful to tie Krishna up uh, to the mortar. By her efforts, you could say her love and the Lord's mercy. Of course, this is a general instruction in Krishna consciousness that to be successful in any endeavor, it requires our efforts and it requires the Lord's sanction or mercy. However, in this particular case, the acharyas very kindly give us a further insight. And that is that as Yasoda was trying unsuccessfully to bind the Lord initially, the Lord thought to himself, Actually, my mother, she's so kind. She's binding me for my own welfare. He was thinking in a compassionate way like that. And the Acharyas say that it was from this compassion of the Lord that gave way to the mercy of the Lord. Of the many energies of the Lord, this um, energy or this potency or this sentiment 
of the Lord, his mercy. It's described as the predominant energy. And all his other energies are subservient to this quality of mercy. The Chayash writes that, that as Yasoda was struggling to tie up Renati's son, the Lord's energies like omnipotence, omnipotence and omniscience, they were all screaming. <laughs> we will not allow the Supreme Brahman to be bound up. All the Lord's energies were screaming. We will not allow the Supreme Brahman to be bound up. But then from the heart of the Lord emerged this mercy. It's actually poetically described as the queen of mercy. This energy is called Kripa Maharani, or simply Chakravartini, the empress, the queen of all energies of the Lord. And when this Kripa Maharani awoke in the heart of Krishna, all the other energies were screaming. <laughs> they all melted away, just like butter. And Krishna allowed himself to be bound. So from the heart of the Lord, first came compassion, and then came mercy. Some acharyas say that that mercy is Vrindavanishwari Shimati Radharani, the tender-hearted tender nature of, of the Lord, compassionate nature of the Lord. So he who cannot be caught, bound by great yogis, was bound by the endeavor and the love of Yashoda, combined with the special mercy, which the acharyas say, by the way, is reserved only for his devotees. Of course, that means everybody if you become a devotee. But then the Lord's mercy continued to flow because while being bound to the churning mortar, he, he actually delivered two personalities fallen personalities. The pastime wasn't over. He delivered two devatas, Nalakuvera and Mani Griva, who had taken birth as two gigantic Arjun trees. Arjun's a type of tree in India, who um, were there in the, in the courtyard of, of Nandagram. <clears throat> They're famously called the Yamala or June trees. Yamala means twins, or June trees. Now, the history of these two personalities is really very interesting. These two trees were previously demigods, as I mentioned, Nalakuvera and Mani Griva. Now, they were the sons of Kuvera. Kuvera is the, the treasurer of the demigods. But unfortunately, being in that opulent situation, these boys somehow became blinded by that material opulence. You, we can hardly imagine what Kuvera's capital is, city is like. It's called Alkapuri, Alkapuri. The opulence there is beyond imagination. Actually, if you think about it, the capitals of all the Devatas in Shvargaloka are opulent because that's a standard feature of Shvargaloka. Just like Lord Indra's capital, Amravati, or Varuna's capital, Vibhavari, I think it's called, or Yamuna's capital, Samini Puri, Brahma's capital, Satkumbi. Brahma's capital's got Sat Satkumbi. They're all very opulent. Just for your information. Actually, one time for Alphad, he said in a humorous way, most of my disciples are aspiring for the heavenly planets. <laughs> so there's a little, some information. <laughs> but go beyond. So while there's actually a, a Vedic maxim called, it states that it is not right to hear about the misdeeds of a person while listening to the glories of the Supreme Lord. It's not right to hear about the misdeeds of someone while at the same time listening to the glories of the Supreme Lord. However, for good instruction, we'll continue speaking about Nalukavira and Manigriva, who became part of the glorious pastimes of the Lord. So these two boys, in that opulence and all that it provided, they became very degraded. Actually, they used to spend a lot of, of that wealth uh, 
not just in, we can say rupees, rubles, or dollars, but in gold coins and gold bars, it's described. They had unlimited wealth, and they used it on, what's that saying go? Wine, women, and song. And another thing is that they were actually very dear to Lord Shiva as well. Actually, I found a, a, a passage where it says that they were personal assistants to Lord Shiva. And this made them very uh, arrogant and very proud. And this made Lord Shiva a little uncomfortable. But he's used to dealing with low-class people in order to elevate them to a higher status. He's Shiva. He's always surrounded by ghosts and witches and hobgoblins because he, the way he looks, he's got, you know, the ashes from the crematorium all over him. He's got snakes and spiders. But he does that to attract those people, to make them into Vaishnavas, because Vaishnavaram Mitashambhu, Bhagavatam says he's the greatest of Krishna's devotees. So Prabhupada said one time that the duty of a first-class man is to make a fifth-class man also first-class. So, but still, it was a little uncomfortable for him <laughs> to deal with it. He did it to elevate them. So these two boys, they would often visit Lord Shiva in Mount Kailash, the abode of Lord Shiva. Now, what makes Mount Kailash very special? It's where the Mondakini River, you could say a tributary of Mother Ganga, flows from there down into the earthly abode. So one time after they'd consumed, it's described Varuni wine or Varuni beverage, which is technically a celestial intoxicating beverage associated with Varuna, the demigod of the oceans. Actually, this beverage came about during the churning of the, of the, the milk ocean. Yeah. And demons like it and the residents of Shwagaloka, they also drink it because it's a type of intoxicant. But this Varuni liquor is not actually available in Kailash. It's, it's too transcendental a place. So these boys brought it from Alkapuri. And they were drunk and they were singing and dancing along with young society girls, apsaras from the heavenly abodes. Actually, they'd also brought these young girls from Alkapuri. So they're all dancing and singing. And then they entered the waters of the Ganges naked, all of them. And they're swimming and frolicking in the Ganges River. Now, amongst the rules for bathing in a sacred river is that one shouldn't go in naked. And one must never play or jump around in these sacred waters. In sacred rivers, one should never play sports, use oil, soap, etc. And one must not wash clothes in the Ganges. One must not consume intoxication. But all the boys were doing all of that. Of course, there are instances where in a private place, in a respectful place, one may bathe naked in the river, but not in a frivolous way. S but the boys were doing all of this. Now, the Bhagavatam, actually, what better way to describe it? The Bhagavatam speaks directly of their foolishness and the foolishness of these young girls. The Bhagavatam verse, it goes, <clears throat> Anta parvisya gangayam ambojavana rajini chikri datur yuvatu bir gajav iva karen ubi. Quote. It's an interesting verse. People generally go to the Ganges to be purified of the effects of sinful life. But here is an example, the Bhagavatam says, of how foolish persons enter the Ganges to become involved in sinful life. It is not that everyone becomes purified by entering the Ganges. The Bhagavatam says, everything spiritual and material depends on one's mental condition. Everything spiritual and material depends on one's mental condition. So now as these boys and girls were, quote, enjoying, what happens? Narada Muni happens to pass by. The Acharyas say that Narada Muni often visits Kailash. He likes to see Lord Shiva. And on, the, on that day, he took a stroll on the banks of the Ganges. And again, Bhagavatam relates perfectly what happened next. Uh, 10, 10, 
think it's verse 6. Quote, Upon seeing Narada, the naked young girls of the demigods were very much ashamed. Afraid of being cursed, they immediately covered their bodies with their garments. But the two sons of Kuvera did not do so. Instead, not caring about Narada, they remained naked. Bhagavatam mentions also that the, uh, these Apsara girls were afraid about being cursed upon seeing Narada Muni, and very quickly put on their garments because um, they knew that in the past, Gautama Rishi had cursed a young Apsara from the heavenly abodes, one of their sisters, you could say, Ahalya, to become a stone. Now they considered Narada Muni to be far more advanced even than the exalted sage Gautama Rishi. So they took all measures not to offend Narada. But not Nalukavera and Monagriva. The Bhagavatam goes on to say, quote, uh, seeing the two sons of the demigods naked and intoxicated by opulence and false prestige, Devarishi Narada, in order to show them special mercy, desire to give them a special curse. Hmm. Special mercy in the form of a special curse. Sometimes a curse could, you could say, be a blessing, a blessing in disguise. There's a saying that the hardest lessons are the ones best learned. And his curse turned out to be very simple, but profound. He cursed those two boys to become trees. He said, trees are not, are not ashamed to stand naked before others for an unlimited time. So hearing this curse immediately caused the, the sons of Kuvera to sober up and beg for leniency because after all, they were devatas. They had some understanding. They had some learning in Vedic culture. So being compassionate, Narada Muni, he assured them that after 100 celestial years, they would be liberated by the Supreme Lord himself. Nal Kuvera Manigriva then they just immediately, they appeared as these two Arjuna trees growing in the courtyard of Nanda Maharaj's home. Now there's an interesting note in Shastra. It says that during the whole of their long lifespans as trees, quote, they retained full remembrance of their identities as devatas. And remembering Narada Muni's words, they patiently waited for the time when Krishna would come and deliver them. That's called patience. And when did that time come? On the morning of Diwali, after Yashoda had bound Krishna to the mortar. Because after binding Krishna to the mortar, Mother Yashoda went back to her duties. And after a while, Krishna became restless. And he started crawling to the center of the courtyard dragging the, the mortar behind him and being all-knowing and omniscient, Krishna was aware of the curse of Narada Muni on these two devatas and also that they had been purified. How? By suffering at the mercy of men, animals, and the elements for those 100,000 years. The mercy of men, because they cut the branches for making handles for axes, the animals, the dogs would pass urine on the trees and the elements, the wind, the rain, the sun, like that. So Krishna very slowly moved towards the trees and he was followed by a small group of children who said, Krishna must want some shade from the scorching sun. Now as he crawled Towards the trees, Krishna was thinking, quote, because Narada Muni is my very dear devotee, I will fulfill his words by giving these two demigods whatever that great soul promised them. Then as Krishna passed between the two trees, the mortar dragging behind him got stuck. And as he pulled on the rope, effortlessly it's described, he uprooted those two huge trees which came down with a loud crash. And that crash caused the residents of Gokul to lose consciousness for an entire 
uh, muhurta, some period of time. And during that brief interval, Nalukavera and Manigriva, they came out of the trees <laughs> in their previous forms and offered very beautiful prayers to the Lord. Very nice prayers. You can read them in Krishna Book or Bhagavatam. But the Acharyas say that um, Krishna's mind was still absorbed in the loving disagreement he just had with Mother Yashoda. And he couldn't help thinking, quote, these two devatas are praising me for freeing them. But my mother doesn't praise me. She scolds me and then ties me up. The words of chastisement I receive from the Brajabhasis is much more appealing to me than the prayers of these two demigods. <laughs> the words of chastisement I receive from these Brajabhasis, like his mother, is much more appealing to me than the prayers of these two demigods. Because the, the prayers of the Brajabhasis are imbued with pure devotion to the Lord, even if they're in the form of chastisement. So, then Krishna told Nalukavera Manigriva, he said this, that their seeing him and receiving love from him were both the results of Narada Muni's grace. Their being able to see him and receiving love from him were both the results of Narada Muni's grace. And when I read that, I thought of Sridhar Prabhupada. Surely, one day, our being, being able to see Krishna and to receive love from Krishna, that will, both of those things will, will be the results of Sridhar Prabhupada's grace upon us. Now, um, <clears throat> Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur then quotes uh, a beautiful shloka. Sadhunam samachitanam sutram matkrit tatmanam darshanam no bhavet bhanda pumshoshno savituryata. The translation of which is, it's very beautiful. Relating again back to this pastime, how Narada Muni delivered these personalities. Quote, when one is face to face with the sun, there is no longer darkness for one eyes. Similarly, when one is face to face with a sadhu, a devotee, who is fully determined and surrendered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one will no longer be subject to material bondage. No one will, no one will, one will no longer be subject to material bondage. <coughs> so, he comments on that shloka. He gives another reading to it. He says, another angle, he says, until one is face to face with the sadhu, liberation remains out of reach and one's material bondage must continue. <laughs> then he says, this raises a question. After seeing a pure devotee, why aren't um, all those persons who see the pure devotee liberated? So he answers that question. He poises it, then answers it. Vishnuv says that the rising of the sun does not dispel the darkness for a blind man. And I found a passage where Sridhar Prabhupada clarifies that as well in another way. He said, persons who are too much offensive, who commit Vaishnavaparat, or offenses to a sato, will have to take some time before being rectified. And back to that quote that, you know, that um, when the sun rises, a blind man can't see that sun. So in the same way, one cannot appreciate the sunshine of Krishna's mercy, be it Krishna or a sadhu, if one's offensive. Then Vishnuv quotes another, gives another reason. He said, the effects of, or he clarifies, the effects of sadhu sangha may be delayed in that as long as one commits offenses to the holy name, he or she cannot be liberated even by seeing Narada Muni. <laughs> so we can get benefit by associating with the sadhu, but if we commit offenses to the holy name, then we can't even get the benefit of a sadhu. 
So he concludes, in other words, the privilege of directly seeing great souls like Narada Muni will only liberate us from material bondage when we no longer act offensively towards such souls or the Lord's holy names. Wow. So there's so much of mercy awaiting for us. It just flows from the spiritual abode in the form of Krishna's representatives, in the form of the Shastras, in the form of Vaishnav Sangha, and Prashadam and the Dham. But we have to be very careful not to become critical of that very mercy we're taking advantage of. And if we are non-critical and we're in the mood of glorifying, then our progress can be very quick. That's why it, at the moment of, in, moment of initiation, we always um, speak about the ten offenses to the Holy Name because by the mercy of the Holy Name we can be delivered when we get it from our Guru. But if we're offensive to the Holy Name, there's no hope for us. So, like that, we have to be aware. Spiritual life's described like a, a razor's edge. With a good razor, you can get a clean shave, but if you're inattentive for a moment, then you get a bloody, teak, bloody cheek. So carefully we move forward. So just after this pastime, uh, Nalu Kuvera and Mani Griva, they departed for, well, they went to Shvarga Loka. <laughs> so soon afterwards, um, let's see, Nanda Maharaj and many Brajabhasis, having heard the loud crashing of the trees, they arrived at the scene. And repeatedly kissing Krishna's face, Nanda Maharaj asked his son, who has tied you up like this? And Krishna quietly sobbed, Pita, it was Mata who tied me up. And then Nanda Maharaj turned to the coward voice and he asked, how did this happen? So they told him, well, Krishna pour, pulled the, the mortar between the trees and, and then it got struck and he got stuck and he kept pulling and then the trees fell down. And then two effulgent beings came out of the trees and they talked to Krishna for some time and then poof, they disappeared. <laughs> so when Nanda Maharaj and you know, the, the elder men and the Brajibhasis were present, they heard the boys speaking like that, like a pandas phantasmagoria <laughs> explanation. It's described the, all the elder men, they broke out in amused laughter, amused laughter. So finally, Nanda Baba and Krishna, they went back into the palace at Nandagram, accompanied by sounds of drums and kartals and singing. And Mother Yasoda was there. But it's described a shame for having been bound, a shame for having bound Krishna and devastated by having put his life in danger. Mother Yasoda had locked herself up in a room in self-imposed exile, like, I guess, modern-day quarantine. She locked herself in. And she would neither leave her room or talk to the other women in the house. She just stayed inside and cried. So at one point, Nanda Maharaj said to Krishna, my son, are you going to go to your mother? Krishna shook his head. He said, no, I will stay with you. So disappointed, Madhya Soda's friends, they said to Krishna, Dear child, then whose milk will you drink when you become hungry? So Krishna replied, I will drink cow's milk mi mixed with gore, or mixed with sugar. And when the ladies asked, And who will you play with? Krishna answered, With my pita or my brother Balaram. Then, looking for a way to invoke Krishna's eternal love for his mother, Nanda Maharaj, he became a little diplomatic. Diplomatic. He, he raised his fist like this into the air. And he said, Son, if you agree, then I will go to your mother right now and beat her for her misdeeds. And hearing this, Krishna at once grabbed his father's fist with his soft hands, tears rolling down his cheeks. <laughs> like, don't do that. And then he softened Krishna up a little bit. So Nanda Maharaj, then he said, Son, you are right. I, I needn't punish her now, for you know she's dying of sorrow anyway. 
She's dying of sorrow anyway. And hearing that his mother was dying, Krishna started to cry for her, churning the ocean of Vatsalya Ras. And he called out piteously, Where is my mother? I must see her now. Maya, Maya, where are you, mother? <laughs> and in desperation, Krishna ran to Mother Rohini, who's Balaram's mother, who carried him into Jashoda's room, where he immediately ran to his mother, who was lying on a bed. He jumped up, and crying in happiness, he hugged her and he kissed her. And as she held, Yashoda held Krishna in her arms, Mother Yasoda's aching heart just melted. All the pain went away. But she was sobbing out of happiness. And Shasta describes that her sobbing could be heard throughout the entire palace, the sound of which made her husband and everyone else present cry in bliss. So by Krishna's magical touch, Mother Yasoda regained her natural effulgence and beauty. And she reassured her friends that I'm okay and happily breastfed her son and again, how does it go? She tasted transcendental bliss. So Krishna and his mother were happily um, reunited on the, on the evening of Diwali, the same day that Krishna was bound to the mortar in the morning. So this is Diwali. Diwali has other meanings as well. In Ramli, there's also a meaning to Diwali. But we can remember these pastimes in Vrindavan on Diwali. Instead of like, nowadays people are just, you know, they're, there's family sentiments, they're exchanging gifts and things like that, but they're also partying and there's firecrackers and <laughs> going off. But this is how we immerse our mind on the auspicious day of Diwali, which will come very soon in this month of Karthi. So Shukadev Goswami, he concludes this heart-touching pastime with a beautiful and very famous um, verse, glorifying Mother Yashoda, Yashoda Mai. He writes, Neither Brahma nor Lord Shiva nor even the goddess of fortune who is always the better half of the Supreme Lord, can obtain from the Supreme Personality of Godhead the deliverer from this material world. Such mercy as was received by Mother Yasoda. <laughs> so ever since the time that Yashoda Devi playfully bound Krishna, the men and women of Braj and even Krishna's old friends, they would often, well, they'd always jokingly call him Damodar, you've been bound by the rope, Damodar. So that's how Krishna got that name. And that from that day on, he was, that's the name he got. Yeah, so <laughs> there are many lessons to be learned from this wonderful pastime um, that caused this month of Kartik to be called Damodar. Again, most uh, notably, that our success in any endeavor, big or small in Krishna consciousness, depends on our, in our endeavor, our sincerity, our service, and the Lord's mercy. You could say once that the Lord's mercy is guaranteed because he's even calling non-devotees to join Krishna consciousness in Bhagavad Gita. Sarva dharmam parichaja mamikam sarvam bhaja. Just, he's not speaking to, to devotees, he's saying just abandon um, all your dharmic ways and come to Krishna consciousness and I will protect you from all sinful reaction. Do not fear. So he's talking to those who have not been freed from sins. So you could say the Lord's mercy is, 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 is guaranteed, but what is required is our own effort. And that we have to be very determined. We can't be lazy, we can't kick back. <laughs> every day is special, every moment is special, every, every iota of our life is special. Just like a materialistic person exhibits much determination in the pursuit of material goals. So we have to show the same determination, even more, to become uh, full-fledged devotees. I 
read about somebody's determination. It wasn't a devotee, but it's a nice example. The other day I was reading about Napoleon. He, he, Napoleon Bonaparte was the emperor of France at one time. And while on one occasion, while leading a, a, a military expedition, he and his men came upon the famous Alpine Mountains, the Alps. And as they slowly moved forward, they came in front of one very massive, massive mountain. And while the soldiers were st stood staring at this formidable obstacle, one of Napoleon's military generals, he pointed to that mountain and he said, Sir, here lies a massive mountain in front of us. Like, you know, saying, how are we going to get over this? So Napoleon had replied very coolly, that is not a mountain. Don't you see? It's a small hill. Now let's climb over it. And he did. And his whole army did. They crossed the Alps. That takes determination. And we require the same determination on our part. And Krishna consciousness, why? Because you could say we have a much higher mountain to climb. A higher mountain than Napoleon had to climb the mountains? Yes. We have a higher mountain. Well, where's that described? In Bhagavad Gita. Daviyesha gunamai mama maya duratyaya mam evaye papadyante mayam etam tarantite. Krishna, this divine energy of mine consisting of the three modes of material nature, meaning, in essence, the material world, consisting of the three modes of material nature. It's very difficult to overcome. But those who have surrendered unto me can easily cross beyond it. And how are we to cross over this, you know, this material energy, this mountain of material energy? Not by trudging on as we can imagine like Napoleon's army did to the snow and the ice and the dangers. We will cross over this mountain of this mountain of material energy by singing and dancing, hearing the Bhagavatam, associating with the devotees, sitting down to peacefully take prasadam, sharing our good fortune with others. This is Krishna consciousness. Yes, there's difficulties along the way, but the austerities, even the big problems, the tragedies, they don't compare to the, to the blissful life of Krishna consciousness and the opportunity we have to go back home, back to Godhead. And by acting in that way, we will get Krishna's mercy. And that's the powerful combination that's so much part of this pastime of Dhammadar Leela and this month. So thank you so much <laughs> for giving me this opportunity to that all of you could begin your your Kartik month, your perhaps your Kartik Vrata by getting a nice explanation of the benefits of Kartik and how certain persons like Kali Priya <laughs> went back to Godhead and uh, the wonderful pastime of the, the Dhammadar Leela, so much that we were able to share today. And I'd like to <coughs> actually conclude with a, a verse which says it all. A verse which says it all, which summarizes everything. As, that, as our Acharyas do, they're so expert at giving us the essence of summarizing it in such a way. Here's a very beautiful verse. Again from Sri Rupa Goswami and again from Padyavali. How we can get the mercy even in Kali Yuga, and he even mentions Mother Yasoda in this verse. So let me repeat this verse that, quote, one who daily sings the glories of Yashoda's son, Krishna, which are as cooling as sandalwood and camphor, is not troubled by the days of Kali Yuga. For him, at every step, there is a torrential flood of the sweetest nectar. Have a wonderful uh, Kartik. <laughs> we'll be continuing with our Vrindavan lectures um, as the month goes by. Instead of actually going to those places now, we can't go, but as we've been experiencing, we can be 
present in them by describing those holy places in Vrindavan and the pastimes that, that took place there and by our charis, a little philosophy to help us understand. So this can be our Kartik Purukama this year, continuing going to all these holy places in Vrindavan by transcendental sound vibration. So today's Friday, and on Tuesday we'll be back with everybody again. I think we'll continue with our Mathura Vrindavan pastimes. We were in Mathura last week, as you know, with Kubja. So now we'll hear about Kuvalyapita and we'll hear about the killing of Kamsa and then we'll go to Prem Sarova and Man Sarova and we'll just keep going. We'll have a wonderful Karti in this way. Thank you, all the English speakers. You've given me this opportunity for a straight um, lecture in, uh, in English. We're also going to record now <laughs> English-Russian and we've been so inspired today, we're also going to do English, Hindi. Maharaj, aren't you getting tired? No, not when we're hearing all this nectar, even again and again and again. Sadhu, sadhu, pade, pade. See you next Tuesday. All glories to Sridhar Prabhupada. Shri Shri Gornitai ki, Shri Krishna Balaram ki, Shri Shivara Shama Sundar ki, Brindavan Eshwari, Shimati Radharani ki, the holy month of Dhamadhar ki, Madhur Shoda ki, Shri Prabhupada ki, back home, back to Godhead ki, take all the fallen conditioned souls with us, Shri Shri Gornitai ki, Jai Jai Sisi Radhe, Shyam, Hare Krishna.